So a little while ago, the Epic Domain Registrar got hacked. And although there were some political implications for this hack, you know, some of the sites that were hosted on it or used it as a registrar were pretty edgy. The thing that I was most concerned about was how could something like this actually happen? How is it that because of the bad security practices ran by a company of boomers, is it that all of these people's personal data got leaked? After all, this isn't the first time that a registrar has had a data breach. I mean, GoDaddy got hacked recently enough and over 1.2 million of their users' data got leaked as well. Yet in order for a person to create some sort of personal website or a blog or something, they need to put their trust into these organizations without being able to verify their backend code or their security practices. So this reveals um, some issues with the internet in general. To understand why these registrars are necessary in the first place, it's important to discuss DNS and the protocols behind the internet as a whole. So when the internet first started off, it was essentially just a bunch of peer-to-peer -peer computers communicating with each other. Someone would host a website and another computer would be able to look it up. This idea of IP addresses become scarce, let alone domain names becoming scarce, was just not thought of at the time. So in the early days of the internet, a lot of the protocols didn't really take into account security and decentralization as a whole. Now, I won't go over in detail how DNS works, but for those who are not familiar, when you go to type in a website such as duckduckgo.com or whatever, your computer will first check your local DNS cache, and then it'll go to a root server and then various other servers until it eventually gets to one that has that domain's IP address. So with the amount of domains out there and how much demand there is for them, we needed to not only authenticate that the IP address associated with the domain is correct, like, so, so someone can just like say that they're from google.com and give it to their personal website. And we also need to deal with the fact that, you know, people may also all want the same domain, even if it is in demand, they need to be able to assign it to people. And this is the reason why we buy domains. But registrars aside, even something like the TLD, the top level domain server, like if the .com TLD server ever went under or there was some issues with it, not to mention all the other top level domains like .org or whatever, this could essentially shut down the entire internet for a little while, you know? Now, something like this would probably never happen. Um, I don't know if something like this has happened in a long time, but it just goes to show that we're putting a lot of our trust into these organizations and services that we can't really verify for ourselves. So it got me thinking, is there alternatives to DNS? Is there alternatives to the regular protocols that we use on the internet every day? And if so, why aren't people using them? So before I get into that, it's probably important to talk about some other things that often come up. Uh, Gopher and Gemini are two protocols which are used as alternatives to HTTP. So HTTP is um, the uh, application level protocol that's used uh, in most of the internet. Now, a lot of other YouTubers in the privacy and security domain will talk about these. Um, these are essentially just alternatives to HTTP. They are reliant on DNS, and so because of that, these issues that I've discussed already are still occurring with them. Although I'm sure these uh, protocols are good, I haven't really looked into them too much. I've been told that like technically they're a lot better, but unfortunately a lot of search engines just don't support them. But yeah, to get this out of the way, these really aren't a replacement for the issues that I've discussed. So the thing is, creating a alternative to something like DNS actually isn't that difficult. There are various other technologies out there that could easily replace it. Something like a distributed hash table, which is actually the technology that's used in a lot of decentralized programs such as uh, BitTorrent and I think even Ethereum uses distributed hash tables in their backend. Essentially what this is, is that it's a way of storing data on a bunch of nodes on a network um, completely decentralized. So each bit of data is a hash function associated with it and it's stored on various neighbor nodes. So essentially if you have the key to the hash function then you can get your data back but when it's stored on your personal computer or whatever the node is you can't actually see other people's data. Kademlia is something I've actually talked about in the past before 
but it's a distributed hash table. Um, it's pretty good. I'm guessing Kademlia is the one used by Ethereum. Uh, it seems to be the most popular one. Um, this is just goes to show that actually creating the protocols isn't the issue. The problem really is getting people to use them in the first place. So it used to be a kind of a coming of the age thing uh, back in the 90s and early 90s even, where a lot of people would create protocols in-house for the projects that they were working on in a company. And it was only really after that that things became standardized. So a lot of the protocols that we use on the internet every day became standardized. So what happens in large uh, regulatory bodies such as IEEE, um, various people with vested interest in it will debate and talk about these protocols and the one with the most clout will essentially just get their way and they'll start using their standard. This is pretty much how it's been since the inception of these regulatory bodies um, and it still continues to this day. So when you create a new protocol or a new complete tech stack for an internet, um, the problem is just getting other people to use them in the first place and getting the likes of browsers and computer manufacturers and everyone else to just use them. It's more of just a limit to people giving a shit for the most part. And that might be a bit too far because, you know, no one wants to redesign their entire system just to accommodate some like new meme protocol just because it may be slightly better. You know, time is money after all, you know. So IPFS, or Interplanetary File System, is an interesting project that's been out for a little while. It's probably the most well-known alternative in this Web 3.0, as people call it. Essentially what it is, is that it's a decentralized file sharing system. It has loads of add-ons that allow you to integrate stuff like Ethereum smart contracts and various other decentralized systems with it. It's been around for a while, and it's like, definitely the most well-known project out there. Uh, it uses distributed hash tables, as I mentioned before, so it's pretty similar to BitTorrent, but how it works is that similar to a blockchain, once you store an object, in this case a file or whatever, on the system, it can't actually be changed, but what they do is they have a versioning system so that the newest version um, has updates to a file or whatever. They break up files into small little objects, and these objects are stored across all the nodes on the network. So you can pretty easily uh, create a website, such as a HTML document or any other type of document, and put it on IPFS. Now, normally what people do is there's a specific um, kind of domain registrar thing. I can't even remember what it's called. I'll put it down below if I remember it. Uh, but essentially people use these, I think it's .zip or something like that, the domains. But people use these and they attach the hash of whatever the file is to it. So people can essentially uh, look up their website or whatever that's hosted on IPFS through a domain name. So it is a good alternative. Um, there's a lot of development and research being put into it. Um, it's easily the most developed one out there at the moment. And a lot of people on YouTube um, who have talked about this have hosted IPFS websites of themselves. So you can check them out if you want. I may actually do a video on this in the future, but honestly, there's just a load of tutorials out there for how to use IPFS for a website or for any sort of file storage. So you can check them out. So it would be ridiculous to talk about a alternatives to the current tech stack without mentioning GNUnet. So GNUnet is created by the GNU Foundation, which of course are responsible for all the utilities and services on Linux. Without these guys, Linux wouldn't really exist. They've created their own technology stack for the internet. So this includes a domain name lookup, a file storage system and a messaging system. They also have some identity providers as well and various other aspects of their framework that aren't really available yet, but will be in the future. Unfortunately, there aren't many applications that have been built on top of GNUnet yet. And outside of the Linux community and the privacy space, a lot of people just don't know about it that much, which is a shame. But knowing the GNU Foundation, this is easily one of the most secure and private um, alternatives to the current technology stack that we use every day. The easiest way to uh, combat these issues with the current internet is to like develop applications on this if you're interested and advocate for other people to do the same. 
So it'd be a miss um, to not mention Freenet, which is another project in this space, but Freenet is probably best comparable to the Tor network itself. So similar to Tor, you need a new browser to access it, I believe. Uh, and similar to the other projects I mentioned, you can't exactly go onto the clear net or the regular web uh, through this browser or through this network itself. From what I've been told, um, a lot of the stuff that's created on Freenet at the moment is pretty nefarious, uh, similar to Tor, except it's like less well known. So I think that's the reason a lot of people use it. Which is sad because a lot of people start need to using uh, Onion services for non-nefarious means, you know. There are people in dictatorship countries and such like that that need things like this in order to freely express themselves. But yeah, this is the main issue with projects like the three that I've just mentioned here, is that mass adoption and people using them are vital for them to go ahead. Even with projects that require a special browser, you know, Unlike Tor, you know, a lot of people aren't going to know about these projects, so they're not going to download some uh, GNU net application in order to access them. So we really just need to publicize them and advocate them as much as possible in order for people to start using them more. And in the future, if they are just regular technology stacks, then they could be integrated with regular browsers, just as uh, Brave or Firefox or Chrome or whatever. And another main issue is, especially with the likes of Freenet um, and the other projects as well, is that they can't exactly access the clear net or the regular internet. They can't go externally outside of this new network that they've created. Which is a big issue if you want to go onto Facebook or YouTube or any of these other services that don't, that don't create websites based on this new network. And this is the main takeaway, I think, from this video. Um, clearly, the internet at the moment is completely broken. And it's going to be a long road before alternatives to it are realized. And the best way that we can really do that is just by advocating it and pointing out the problem where it is. It's not to do with technological limitations, although that is a big aspect of it. It's placing our trust in large organizations that we have no say or no control over. And we can't even verify what they are doing in the background. The internet as it was, was not developed for security and privacy in mind. And it certainly wasn't developed for users control in mind. But yeah, that's it for today. Um, if you have any questions about anything I talked about, please let me know, leave a comment below. Um, until then, I'll see you next time.